Hey, this is Christoph. In the last episode, we covered installing Nginx two different ways, from source and using app get install. Now, if you use the app get install, then your configuration file is going to be at this directory here, etc nginx nginx.conf. Go ahead and open that up. And I'm gonna walk you through some of what I think are the most important ones. If I skip out on a few of these and you're interested in it, then I would definitely recommend checking out the documentation. It's pretty thorough in explaining what each part is. But if you look at it here, you've got simple directives and context directives. These simple directives are the top three here and the ones inside of these blocks. And the context directives are gonna be the blocks like events and HTTP, for example. Let's look at the first two here where you have user www data. So the first obviously is the user and group that Nginx worker processes are going to run as. Now, in order for Nginx to bind to ports below 1024, and this is a Linux restriction, we have to run Nginx as root, but we, we want our services to run with the least amount of privileges. So that's exactly what happens. Nginx starts as root, but then it spawns the child processes as this user we have set as www.data. And we can verify this. But first, let's look at this next line here. This is the number of worker processes that we want to create when Nginx starts. We have it set to four right now. We can change this, and I'm gonna show you how we know how many are, are spawned if we weren't looking at the configuration. And also just to show you the users as well. So the command that we're gonna run is psaux, and then we're gonna pipe it grep nginx. All right, so if you look on the left column side, you'll see it says root www data, and then it says that four times. So as I just explained, it, spawn, it, create, it starts nginx as root, and then it spawns child processes as www data. That way we restrict the access that those processes have. All right, now, this command, just in case you're not completely familiar with it, the PS just stands for process status. And it basically just gives a snapshot of the current running processes. The command or parameters AUX gives you all the users' processes. It shows you processes listed by, listed by usernames, which is exactly what we want to do in this scenario here. And it shows all the processes, even ones not attached to a terminal. So if we go back in the configuration and we change this to, I don't know, maybe uh, two. And I'll explain in a second how we decide. And then we restart Nginx. Then we run the this command right here. We only have two worker processes. And the way that you decide what number to put on there depends on the number of CPU cores you have. So if you have dual core, then you would put two quad core, you put four, et cetera, et cetera. If you're not sure, or if you want to have a configuration that's going to work on all kinds of different machines, then you can set this to auto and Nginx will try to figure out by itself. So how do you determine how many processor cores you have? You can use grep again, which we just saw a second ago proc cpu info and then you pipe it wc dash l and it shows that i only have one in this virtual machine here so i should really go back in my configuration and change that one more time i'm not going to do that for sake of time but let's go back in the configuration file now third line is just the process id number that you can look at if you want inside of this events context directive we have a worker connections number, and the number is 768. Now this sets the maximum number of simultaneous connections that can be opened by a single worker process. So if you take this number, you multiply it by the worker processes we just looked at, that's the total number of connections that you can have with this Nginx configuration. You can change this number, and there are ways to figure out what number to set it to, but be aware that Linux by default comes with a, a a certain number of open files that you can have because this is what's going on. It treats these as as files. So every time there's a worker connection, it's a new file. And so if you have more open files than Linux allows by default, then you're going to run into a problem. So you have to also 
up that Linux limit. Again, that's going to be in a blog post that I'm going to link below this video uh, just so, for the sake of time. And it also goes into more depth. All right, so now let's go to the next line, which is multi accept on or off. This In this case, it's off because it's commented out. Frankly, I haven't seen anything online so far that says to put it on or off, but the default is off and a lot of other configurations that I've seen trying to figure this out also had it as off. So I'm really not entirely sure about this, this one. I wish I could figure it out. If anybody figures it out, please let me know. Okay, now let's talk about the HTTP context directive with uh, these simple directives here. The first one is send file on. This is, if you're going to be serving any large files, this is crucial to this because it really drastically speeds up large static file transfers. If you're gonna put send file on in this configuration, then you also need to turn on TCP no push. This is to be used with, um, with send file on. And this basically just optimizes the amount of data that you can send at the same time at once. So it's, uh, it's a good little, feature there and then again we have TCP no delay on and this basically just forces the socket to send data in what's called its buffer and it doesn't matter what the packet size is it just shoves it out there then we have keep alive timeout of 65 if you're familiar with keep alive settings this basically just sets how long you want to keep alive the client connection that will stay open on the server. So that's how long it stays open on the server. And this can really uh, save up on CPU and memory usage and uh, also reduce the amount of latency with the handshakes, etc. So it's a good little feature to have. I'm gonna skip the next one. And this includes MIME types. All right, here we have log different logging paths. So for access logs, error logs, good to know. Just in case you run into any issues, you might want to keep an eye on these from time to time. And then gzip settings for compression. You can go through here and change which types of files get gzipped, uh, the sizes, etc. This could save CPU cycles for files that you know are so small, they're barely going to get compressed anyway. So why use the CPU cycles for it? This is something you should tweak on your own and see what you like and don't like. And then I think, oh, there's one more thing I want to show you. These virtual host configurations, this includes these different paths. We're going to be using the, the second one, the sites enabled path. And as you'll see in the next episode, this is how we can bring our sites online, our applications online um, with PHP FPM if you're using PHP or whatever else language you're using. So. Stay tuned for the next episode and thanks for watching.